And he said, the purpose of life is not any external achievement, no award or any profession or professional success, but the life purpose is to be truly alive with all its ups and downs and to embrace the gift of life. And I was like, holy moly, like that is truly powerful because that completely disconnects the dependence on something external to happen for me to feel fulfilled and to, for me to feel like I'm living already my purpose. I'm not having to search for it or find the purpose. And I think it's connected with, so for me, transform or co uh, transformational coaching really means that I support people in transforming their lives. And as I mentioned before, I do that through a holistic approach where I look at all specific areas of life because it's all connected. If we, it's kind of like a piece of cake. If you take one piece out, you don't have the whole cake anymore. Something is missing. So in order for you to have the full cake of life, you have to make sure that all the ingredients are in there and that it's all connected to each other. That's, I also got to the point where I focused on myself because I realized nobody can give uh, nobody can give me what I'm looking for if I'm not willing to step up myself for myself and give that to myself first. Because it's it's like if I give you a gift, no matter what it is, if you're not, if you don't feel like you are worth it to give it to yourself, how can you really appreciate it if I give it to you? And that is really, really, it was a life-changing experience. I cannot depend on someone else to bring out the best in me. That has to come from within. And once it comes from within, from a place of self-love and self-appreciation, then now I can be the best version of me, which is then even more beneficial for those who I want to take care of. It is not at all selfish. Mind you, you could even say it is selfless because it's giving your best to others and in order to give your best to others, you have to be your best self. Hey guys, welcome to the Boardroom Podcast. Today we are joined by one guest that you are going to want to have in your party, in your team, consulting, instructing, leading you. And in this episode, you're going to learn why. Today we have with us Martin Schoendorfer. Martin, how are you doing today? I'm very, very good. Thank you so much for having me today. You have a very strong, um, direct way of speaking. I can't wait to get started. A question for you. We always ask this question to all our guests. Where is your favorite city? My favorite city. Wow, that's I love that question. Um, my favorite city. I do love London. I've been there uh, twice in my life and the last time in the beginning of the year. And I just love the energy there. It's so beautiful and... Yeah, so I'd say right now, London is definitely my favorite city. Okay, so here's the scenario. You and I are in London, right? We are on a famous street in London. We're having a chat, having coffee maybe, some tea. And one of my friends are approaching. I say to myself, you know what? I'm going to introduce Martin to my friend. And I say to my friend, friend, this is Martin. Martin, this is friend. When my friend meets you, who exactly is Martin that he's meeting at this time? It really depends because one of the things that I believe is that we have a different version of ourselves and different aspects of life and different situations of life. So if we are walking in a very friendly manner, no business involved, then I'm probably going to be slightly different than if it was a business meeting and we would walking down the street um, in, and then meet a friend of yours. So if it's a friendly meeting that we are having and we're walking down the street, then they, I would not talk about business. I would not talk about, you know, um, anything that is connected with coaching or changing your life. I would just mm -hmm. be chill and relaxed and be happy to make a new human connection. So would we then say that you are a people person, you get along well with others, you socialize, socialize 
very comfortably. Absolutely. But also here, I have to say, it really depends on the day. Some days I prefer just being by myself. And mm -hmm. I have very clear boundaries around that, actually, because also with friends, I always say uh, it's very important to look at my my own well-being first, because if I look after myself from a standpoint of self-love, then I can also be there for other people in a more effective way. And if I feel like, you know, I just want to be by myself today, I always communicate that and make sure that uh, those boundaries are upheld. There is a common saying. I don't know if it's um, common in Germany, but the saying is that I will take care of you and you will take care of me. And I was on Instagram, funny enough, on Instagram a few weeks ago, and I saw a video of Jim Ron. And Jim Ron is this famous uh, motivational speaker and entrepreneurs and biz business owner and stuff like that. He was pretty inspirational. He's passed on now. One of my favorite guys, man. Jim Ron said that you shouldn't say that you're going to take care of someone and they should take care of you. What you should instead say is that I will take care of me so that I can take care of you. And I want you to take care of you so that you can take care of me. And it says that it says that is more powerful than the idea of taking care of someone else and hoping that they take care of you. Why I've not heard someone besides Jim Ron echo these sentiments. So why do you believe in this approach to self-care and in taking care of others, as we would put it? Mm -hmm. So the first thing is if when you shared the first saying, like, um, I take care of you, you take care of me, that creates a dependence. So I'm, if, I, if I live that way, then I would depend on someone else taking care of me. And I'm not really willing to take care of myself in that moment, or I'm not able to maybe. And the problem with that dependence is that if we don't have those people around us, then we don't have anyone to take care of ourselves. If you first focus on yourself, then you don't depend you don't depend on other people taking care of you. And that way it, you're holding up yourself. And then I personally believe that through that um, independence, you can uh, support other people so much more because then you can give from your strength. You can give from an infinite amount of love. And that, in my opinion, is way more powerful than first needing someone else to help me so that I can also um, help someone else. At the same time, it's I've come across that a couple of times in, in uh, coaching where people say, they need the the way they grew up is that they have to make other people happy. The problem is if everybody makes everybody else happy, who in the end will be happy? Because nobody can focus on themselves. Everybody just focuses so much on the lives of others that nobody focuses on themselves anymore. So basically it's just being passed around and nobody in the end actually has like anything. It's like with food. If I give you food, you give that food to someone else and in the end, nobody will eat. I'm hearing some very powerful things here. And profoundly is that if I take care of you so that you can take care of me or I take care of you so you can take care of someone else, then nobody is going to be taken care of. No one's going to be happy. I can't, I cannot depend on someone else to bring out the best in me. That has to come from within. And once it comes from within, from a place of self-love and self-appreciation, then now I can be the best version of me, which is then even more beneficial for those who I want to take care of. It is not at all selfish. Mind you, you could even say it is selfless because it's giving your best to others. And in order to give your best to others, you have to be your best self. How did you even arrive here? Because... I've never thought this way before. Did you read a book? Was it training? Were you taught this way? Is it the German culture? I don't know. How did you arrive at these, um, this way of thinking? And it's so profound and rooted in psychology, mind you. It's, I think it's a combination of things. There's no one answer with how I, I got to that point. Um, I'd say it's a life experience because I've been through quite a lot of ordeals in life and through those experiences, what, like for a long time, I, I felt, you know, that in specific areas of life, 
um, like re relationships or friendships, but also business that I needed someone else in order to fill kind of a void that I was experiencing. And a few years ago, I had a conversation with someone about, about life purpose. And I think it also kind of changed my perspective in that regard. And he said, the purpose of life is not any external achievement, no award or any profession or professional success, but the life mm -hmm. purpose is to be truly alive with all its ups and downs and to embrace the gift of life. And I was like, holy moly, like that is truly powerful because that completely disconnects the dependence on something external to happen for me to feel fulfilled and to, for me to feel like I'm living already my purpose. I'm not having to search for it or find the purpose. And I think it's connected with your question, what we've been talking about, where really through that internal sh um, shift in that sense, I also got to the point where I focused on myself because I realized nobody can give uh, nobody can give me what I'm looking for if I'm not willing to step up myself for myself and give that to myself first. Because mm -hmm. it's it's like if I give you a gift, no matter what it is, if you're not if you don't feel like you are worth it to give it to yourself, how can you really appreciate it if I give it to you? And Ooh. That is really, really, it was a life-changing experience. Mm, that right there is powerful, you know. That is powerful. I, I'm putting it out there. I'm going to put it out there. Here's what's happened. So you can, all right, you can do the best you can for someone else. And life is about perspective. So I don't know if you're familiar with um, CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. You're familiar. And for mm -hmm. our listeners and audience members who are not familiar, CBT basically postulates that it's not what happens to you that's important. It's how you process what happens. Okay. So basically what CBT postulates is that whenever something happens, it is not what happens that determines how it affects you. It's how you process what has happened. So you're walking down the street and you might, let's say your, your cell phone gets lost. God forbid your cell phone falls out your pocket and it's lost. You could process it as, oh, life is against me. Or you can say, well, this is an opportunity to replace my cell phone because I've been hesitant about it. Or this is an opportunity to learn how to take better care of my stuff. So the reason why I bring this up is because you can do your best for someone, but if they don't believe that they deserve your love, your attention, your investment, whatever it is that you're doing for them, it's never going to work. And at that, at that point, it is not you that at, that's at fault. It's them. So here, here's a question that I really do want to pick your brain with let's put it out there what are some of the things that you see people do today and i don't mean just young people or old people people in general of all walks of life what are they doing that you would say is self-sabotaging as it comes to their happiness and their living a life that's fulfilling and meaningful mm -hmm. so of course everybody's unique everybody has a different background different upbringing. So I'm going to go in a very general sense here, of course. Uh, but one thing that is very, very common is that we let ourselves be defined um, on the past and also the worst possible future. So very often what I, what I realized is because we are very powerful beings, because we can just take one thought and create a whole movie in our head and create a whole life uh, based on that one thought and that thought can trigger either the past or the future but very often what happens is that we are so stuck in the past and also making other people responsible of where we are today that we give our power away mm -hmm. so i i guess that's that's like the one thing that that is um yeah, what, what, what happens to so many people is that we give our power away to people who might not even be in our lives anymore. Like, oh, 10 years ago, this happened and it still affects me. That person is responsible. The problem with that is it maybe, it maybe took like one minute or one second for a person to say something to our, to us. And then for the next 10 years, we well, think about on. it over and over and over again. So basically we are torturing ourselves more than someone else torturing us. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that, 
Go ahead, go ahead. And then we also put it onto the future. Mm -hmm. So we're like, oh, things will never change. Or we're the outside has to change for us to be different or to feel different. And I think that's also based on what most like the society kind of the in I see it from in so many different cultures. Um, it's what I learned in one of the seminars I participated in. They called it the half do and be mentality, which is the idea that you have to have something in order to then do something so that in the end you can feel positive, happy, or any kind of emotion. And I would say, switch it around, start with the being first, start with how do you want to feel? I always give this exercise to uh, to clients of mine, instead of writing a to-do list, write a to-be list. How do you want to feel today? How do you, What do you want to experience today? And then adjust your to-do list in accordance with the to-be list, because then you're connecting the physical action. action. And emotion. Exactly. And that is so more powerful because then you're, your movie in your head is shifting because you're thinking about a vision that you have. You're thinking about a goal that you have. So that's why it's also important to have goals, to have, um, to have a vision because that way you can make a way, like you can make it work make way more easy for yourself to navigate through life because you know what you want. And then even if you feel stuck, if you feel negative, you can go back to that picture. You can go back to that vision and create emotion because emotions are created through the pictures that we create in our conscious mind. And yeah, it's very powerful. You know, you know, the thing that I like that you said, instead of thinking of what you want to do, think about how you want to be. And earlier, like at the start, you mentioned that um, you said, holy moly, when your friend said to you, basically in a nutshell, life isn't necessarily about being happy. It's about experiencing the full spectrum of emotions and appreciating them for what they are. So at this moment, you're feeling sad. That is beautiful because you can think that you're feeling sad and there's a reason my dog, well, <laughs> let's hope your dog didn't die, but, you know, a very logical reason for why you would feel sad. I, an idea I want to put to you and then you can um, tell me your thoughts. We have social media, such a huge part of our days today. So if you look at the top 10 most visited websites, believe it or not, and I'm not going to say the word out loud, but I believe for the first time, adult websites are not in the top 10 most visited websites in the world. Why? Six or seven of them are social media websites. Google in and of itself isn't necessarily social media, but Google is there, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, believe it or not, TikTok, and Twitter. Those are in the top six or so most visited websites in the world when I checked a few months back. The reason why I bring this up is because when you go on social media, as Elon Musk would say, and I just spoke with another guest where I shared the same sentiments is whenever you have a bad day or you had a loss in business, you're not going to really post that on social media because it's not attractive and it's not sexy. But when you make a big win, you're going to put that out there. And we're spending so much time on social media that we're having a skewed understanding of what reality really is. We think we have to be more beautiful, we have to make more money, we have to be more successful. In your own, perhaps experience, perhaps your studies, perhaps what you've seen with others, how has social media negatively impacted our mental health? And I want you to connect this with holistic coaching because you're an holistic coach so maybe you want to also explain what holistic coaching is but how has social media negatively impacted our mental health and stopped us from living our best lives powerful question i love it um, i'm going to go into um explain what holistic coach means because that way i can connect it also to the question um and make it more clear uh, what i'm going to what i'm about to say uh, on that subject as well so a holistic coach for me what I do is that I look at all areas of life because we are not just one dimensional beings. We have so many facets to who we are and we cannot disconnect it because no matter where we go, if we go to work, if we are uh, hanging out with friends in family, we have different versions of ourselves, but the, the deep rooted beating that uh, being that we are, it's still the same. It's still us that is going there. 
So we cannot disconnect like very often it happens. It's like leave your bags outside, like your emotional bags outside the office door where it's like, what do you expect me to do? Like press a button. It's not possible. Like I still, when, once I go through that door, I still, I'm still a human being. And being, being is like thinking, feeling, I'm still there. I cannot turn it off. So with the holistic approach, it's really important to put the human being factor first and not the doing. We're not human doings. We are human beings. And connecting that to the to your question, one part of, of life or of the, one of the facets of, of our um, presence here on this earth is the social factor. So a social environment. And the social media platforms, I think it gives an incredible, powerful tool for us to connect and to learn and to grow. But the way it's negatively affecting mental health is what we mostly do is, especially when it comes to looking at other people's profiles and seeing what are they up to, how do they live their lives, what the, what's their success, we start comparing how we feel how we are, the beingness of ourselves with a small fraction of what other people show what they have. So we are comparing emotions with outside um, materialistic things that people show us. That's kind of like comparing apples with a, a glass of water where it's like, it's just not the Very same. You cannot yeah. compare it. And that comparison usually has a huge impact negatively on how we feel. And it's not fair to ourselves because we are, we are going from an internal perspective and through our eyes and ears and through our senses, we compare uh, something that is not comparable. And, and you know, the thing that's, that's so dangerous about it. So we see what someone else has posted and they say, oh, I'm so happy. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. So I saw um, she's an influencer, um, Instagram model, as we put it. She posted a video of herself in France and someone on their knees um, proposing to her. And she stretched out her hand and got the ring on the finger and she was holding the guy's hand and walking. And I looked at it and I said, this is just so fake. Because when she got engaged, let's say that she actually got engaged. The focus was never on the guy in front of her confessing his love and desire to be with her. It was on the ring, stretching the finger, ensuring that the camera was getting everything. And then while they were walking away, she was never looking at the guy. So she was ahead holding his hand and he's following. But she was never looking at the, the, the guy who just proposed to her. She's looking at the camera. He is not looking at her. He's looking at the camera. And I'm like, am I the one that just got engaged? So I was like, all right. Let's see if the ring is in the other pictures that she's posted. She posted a few pictures afterwards. And I looked at it and the rings are not in the picture. And I'm wondering what exactly is happening to us? Is it so much about getting acceptance of others? It's going to lead to such a question. You, it might blow your mind. Is it so much about getting the acceptance of others versus experiencing life for what it is? We cannot separate the negative from life because the negative adds value. So here's my question. At the start of the episode, we spoke about taking care of me so I can take care of you. And in this example, we're seeing the complete opposite. I'm seeing you do this for me and I do this for you so that they can like us. And they don't even know who they are. And they are millions of people that we're suddenly connected to. Doesn't this then overload our capacity? The first part is, doesn't this then overload our capacity to not only think rationally, because now we're thinking about the wrong thing, but also measure just what is important because all of a sudden it's not just my best friend or the three or four people in my class that are going off to university. It's a hundred thousand people posting the pictures of them going to university and I'm not going to university. That proportionally is very different from three or four people in my community in my neighborhood that are going off to college. So does this overload our ability to then judge what is normal and what is an outlier? And if you're familiar with how dopamine works, doesn't this also make us 
experience emotions a little bit more extremely in terms of the effect it has on dopamine, meaning that now we can't get the same level of enjoyment because so many more people are doing, we have to do something more extreme. And because of that, when the dopamine levels up, we crash so much more severely. It, are these things, you know, connected? I think what happens with social media, the example that you just shared is um, because mm-hmm. social media in its, in its best form is what I mentioned before about connection. I use social media a lot for my, for my business because I can connect with people that I might not otherwise be able to connect. I mean, that's how we also connect. And I'm very grateful that this exists because it gives so many opportunities. But it's really about how we use it. And the thing is, we're not being taught effectively how to use social media in a positive way. Because in the example you gave, it's social media is about connection. So yeah. when that person creates a video and clearly is not connecting with the person that is at least what it's what it seems like to be the most important focus in that moment of being becoming engaged to that person. So there is clearly a disconnection happening and they want to use that in order to connect with other people where it's like, how does that work? You want me to connect with you and you're clearly showing that you're not even connected to the person who is engaging with you right now or engaging to you, proposing to you right now. So how, how is that going to work? Like if you're not connected to yourself and to the person right in front of you, how can you connect to millions of people who might see your posts? I think it doesn't work that way because you are, you're showing disconnection, but you want me and expect me to connect with you. Yeah. And I think that is not the most effective way and not the best way to use social media. There's nothing wrong with sharing those experiences, but it really depends on how do you go about it and how do you use it. With the dopamine, I think also social media, it can give a lot of, it can create a lot of emotion because we can really get involved with what we see with other people because in our subconscious, we don't differentiate like where the emotion is being created in in our subconscious mind, we don't differentiate between what's real and what's not real. So once we accept the information that's coming toward us and we are involved with it, the problem I see behind that is that if we are hanging out on social media for hours and hours every single day, then we're disconnecting to reality in that sense. So especially when our reality is not as exciting as what we see other people's lives um, are, then it's going to be very difficult to create that same level of those hormones being created through Mm -hmm. our reality. The problem with that is that in order for us to change something about that, we'd have to stop using, like taking that drug of social media and start implementing that or taking that energy and start changing something about our lives. Mm -hmm. But it's easier taking the phone or opening the computer than changing your life. So it's really, it comes back to like the being, beingness. Start like focus on yourself first and then whatever you do then consciously use it. Be aware of how you're using the things that are available to you. It's the same with food, with with anything that, that like external. It's really about how you use it and for what reason. That's true. And um. Just to po- just to tell an antecedent story, it's like you said, it's the same situation where social media allowed you and I to get connected. I want to allow us in this conversation because the conversation isn't necessarily about me and you that's taking place right now. It's about bringing value to a wider audience so that they can live their best lives. And that is where the application, the use of the platforms come in, that's social media. So I do agree with what you have to say on that. You are a transformational coach. And it says right here that you support people in creating a compelling vision, upgrading their self-image, and taking inspired action. Can you, in a nutshell, just break this down for us? Transformational coaching, what is it? Who is it for? And what value does it bring to the people that really need it? Mm -hmm. So for me, uh, transformational coaching really means that I support people in transforming their lives Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And as I mentioned before, I do that through a holistic approach where I look at all specific areas of life because it's all connected. If we, it's kind of like a piece of cake. If you take one piece out, you don't have the whole cake anymore. Something is missing. So in order for you to have the full cake of life, you have to make sure that all the ingredients are in there and that it's all connected to each other. Mm -hmm. And um, in a nutshell, I can I, I like to use a metaphor in that sense, um, where uh, if you imagine that you are on a ship in the middle of the ocean and you do not have you don't you do not know where you are, then it's very difficult to go anywhere because you're like, well, I don't know where I am, so I don't know even even if I have a destination, I don't know where to go next because I am unaware of my current position. If you don't have a destination, which is kind of like the vision and the goals that I that I support people with creating, if you don't have that, but you know where you are, you still don't know where to go next. Then you're depending on the outside circumstances, whatever happens in life to navigate you to the next kind of path, to the next street, to the next goal. So it's incredibly important, in my opinion, to know exactly where you are with your mindset, with your habits, with your subconscious programming. And very clear about what is it that you want in life? What is your dream life? What does that look like? Who do you want to be in that vision? Because if you have that, if you have the destination and you have where you are right now, then you can start looking for a path. You, start, you can choose where to go. Mm -hmm. And then it's kind of like also if you're in the middle of the ocean, it's about the ship. You need a very strong ship if you want to go from... Uh, through, through, or if you want to cross the ocean, if you just use a river, then you have to be mindful that it's a different kind of ship or a small boat. So mm -hmm. if you know where you are and where you want to go, you can also decide what you will need. So the ship is the physical body, your strength, how you can navigate through life. Also in that ship is your crew. So it's the people around you. Who do you surround yourself with most of the time? And I personally, I myself as a coach, see myself as the crew on someone else's journey. I'm there to support. I'm there to, to help them navigate if they, because not, not a, nobody can do everything by themselves. It's true. true. I would say like, I don't work with people who feel like they need me because it's not about need. Neediness is a very negative kind of uh, emotion. It's almost like dependency again, isn't it? Exactly. I can't Absolutely. really yeah. Yeah. I always go with want. Do you want to work with? Because if you want, that's a completely different um, mentality, dynamic. completely di different dynamic. And the last but not least aspect of that metaphor is the mindset. Hmm. How do you look at things? What's your, what's your attitude? If you're on that ship, imagine you're on a real ship and you're the captain and you're like, well, I don't care, you know, where we go next. How would your crew feel? They would not trust you. You would be thrown off the ship very soon because they're like, we don't want that person to navigate through those waves. And the same in That's life. Mm -hmm. There's a, the waves of life. If you don't care about your own life, if you don't care about the people around you, then you will not have the people around you who will support you because nobody will be there. Mm -hmm. So combining all that is really, for me, what also coaching is about. That's... um. That's inspirational. That is deep. It's thorough because it covers so many bases. I want to sit back and um, just go through my mind a bit. Transformational coaching helps, well, I would say clients, right? Clients. Yeah. Helps those clients live a more meaningful life by helping them to embrace life for what it is, ups and downs and so on. And it takes into account their where they currently are, where they're going, the mindset that they have, and the desire that they have for change. Because, you know, the interesting thing that a lot of us really need to understand is, and not you, because you would have understood this, but we as the clients need to understand that unless we are willing and desirous for a change, no amount of help is going to help us because it won't do what's necessary. Now, I'm here with you well-spoken, well-put-together, obviously well-read, very, very adept at what you do. You have worked with many clients, and you've seen changes take place that perhaps even I myself would think, wow, this can't happen. 
when you come across a person, and this is a question, when you come across a person and they have a certain set of problems, the problems can be very mundane. Maybe they don't feel they have a purpose in life, or maybe it can be something a little bit more drastic. Their relationships are always failing and you want to help them. What are the steps that you take them through? I know it might vary from, you know, client to client because different needs require different approaches. But what are some of the things that you do to help them? Do you take them out in the field? Do you have them read an excerpt? Do you try to unlock some of their childhood trauma? What are some of the things that you do or approaches that you take to help someone who is in, let's, let's not say need, but they will definitely benefit from your services. Mm. So there's one thing I always do, and that is uh, an exercise called the Wheel of Life. And it's really about getting that understanding of where are you right now? Like, what's your, what's your programs? What's your thoughts? What's your results in your current uh, life? And then go into what would you like it to be like? How do you want those different parts of life to look like? How do you want to experience it? Because that gives like the base, the foundation of where we can build on that throughout the coaching and say, okay, what out of what you've described and figured out through that exercise, what is the next goal that you would like to focus on in the direction of your vision? Because creating that vision first is imperative because if we don't have that vision, like I mentioned with the metaphor with the ship, if we don't know where we go, we cannot set the next goal. And we might we might be able to set a goal, but we don't know where it will in the end lead us to. So having that vision, we can set a goal and say and ask ourselves a very simple question. Does that goal get me into the direction of my vision? Yes or no? Ooh. And if I say I don't know. Well, then you can figure it out or become more clear about your vision or the goal itself. If you say no, then I'm like, well, then I'm not going to do and follow that goal because it's not serving my, my vision. It's not okay. serving my dream. If I say yes, then I know, okay, this is down the line going into the direction of my vision. So that's like the first, the first part of the coaching, which depending on the person might take um, some time where it, it can be very quick, depending on how much time people have invested on their goals, their dreams, their vision before. And then after that point, it's quite open because I'm a very intuitive coach. So I don't plan the whole coaching journey because who am I to go into the coaching journey with you and say, this is what you need. I yeah. don't work that way. It's, it's, and I, I know a lot of people who have experiences with uh, coaches. I'm like, well, that's more consulting. You go in there, they give you a plan and they tell you what to do in order to get specific results. But I'm like, I'm not here to get specific results. I'm going to, I'm getting, uh, I'm, I'm here to get your specific result, not based on what worked for me, not what worked for other people, nobody else's life blueprint kind of, but I'm here to help you create your own blueprint. So I have exercises, I have tools, but it's, it's the first step. And the most important step is to really become clear of who do you want to be? Who do you, what kind of self image do you want to grow into? And what's your vision? Because based on that, we can figure out the next steps together. And that's also incredibly important is we are in this together because I'm here to support you in that once you're a client of mine, so it's not me being up here. I'm here from on the same level. We're here. Mm -hmm. Like I'm right next to you by your side. I'm not better than you. I'm not further ahead um, of you. I might have more experience in a certain area of life, but that doesn't mean I'm further ahead Understood. because we are, if we are here in this very moment in life, we are on the same level. We are in the same, in the same experience in that very moment. So I'm not further ahead. Otherwise I wouldn't be able to meet you right now because we would not be yeah. here. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You, you said something that it echoes the sentiment of a guest we had on recently. His name is Dr. John James Santangelo. He's from, his, his dad is from Italy and he's, he's, he works in NLP. That's neuro linguistic programming, I believe. And he said something 
it said also, as you rightly said, it said the things that you focus on are the things that you become. But even more importantly than that, he said that whenever we make a decision, so we have two hands, all right? We're going to make a decision. On the one hand, I could go with this decision. And on the other hand, I could go with this decision. What should determine the decision I go with is which of these decisions that I make is going to move me closer to my ultimate goal in life. And it says if we think about that, and we act in such a way, then we will lead better lives because then we're making better decisions. Now, I want to ask you, because you seem familiar with the overall process of decision-making, given that's what's going to help us to you know, live fulfilling lives and undergo transformation. How do we make better decisions in the short term that positively affect our long term? And the reason why I ask this is because and it's, it might also mean you have to help us understand how to decide our life's purpose. But a lot of us, we go through life doing what we're told is the right thing to do, what we think is the right thing. Go to school, go to college, get a safe job, get married, have two kids, retire, and then hopefully pass on in peace. But what if that's not for us? So how can we make better decisions to live more fulfilling lives is really what I'm asking. How to make decisions to live a more fulfilled life. First of all, I always suggest that you make a decision that you are going on that journey of discovery because that is the difference also between need and want. If I say I want to go on that journey, I want to figure out what, what that purpose is. I want to figure out what life is about. That's a decision in itself. Mm -hmm. Very often, more often than not, people don't make that decision. They're like, well, let's see what happens and what I can do with that. So it's really about the decision to show up, to be there, to, to get involved in your own life, to take that power back to you where you're like, I'm on the driver's seat of my life. I'm not uh, the passenger. I'm the driver. So that itself is one of the most important decisions, in my opinion, to decide that you take charge of your life. And decision-making as with pretty much everything else, is also a habit. So the more often we do it, the more easy it will become, the more quicker we will be able to decide. And it also is very much connected to how much do you understand about yourself? Because when we make a decision, I mean, there's a multitude, like unlimited um, possibilities of what we can choose and what we can do in every single moment. We, you and I, we chose to be here right now, but we could be going for a walk. We could take a nap. We could meditate. We could do sports. Like there's so many things that we could do right now, but we made a decision to be here to also serve other people. So it's, it's very much connected to you. What do I want? What's the, the why behind the action or the why also behind a decision? Why do I want to decide in this direction or in that direction? And the more we practice it, the more easy it becomes when we know ourselves better. Because it's important to differentiate is the decision that I'm about to make coming from some kind of a lack or from fear, from a negative or might also be a positive um, habit or program that is automated in our, in our subconscious mind. Or is it coming from the vision? Is it coming from, I know exactly where I want to go? And then I always ask a question, does that, if you make that decision, does it serve me? Yes or no. If it doesn't serve me, and that also includes if it doesn't serve me, it does not serve other people. It's true. At least in the connection, what we talked about early on, about self-love, about sharing. If it's, mm -hmm. if I don't take myself seriously and important uh, and, and put importance on my life, then it will mm -hmm. also eventually have a negative impact on other people. The reason I'm saying that also is I've, I've seen it so many times also in my own life, in, in my own uh, family and, and social circle. A lot of people, they, they do something for others. They care for others, maybe family members or friends or clients, and they put themselves um, second. The problem is first, when they put other people first, so, um, Let's say it's someone who always like, likes to give gifts, always likes to show up for you, help you, support you. What if you say, I don't need you right now? Then I'm not getting from you 
what I need and I make you responsible how I feel. So it will create conflict. Also, the problem is that if I make you happy or if I do my best to make you happy, then you are happy. And then you look back and be like, well, you look miserable. How, what does that going to do to me? Then I'm also dependent that you acknowledge me because if, I, if you don't acknowledge me either way, then I don't feel I'm getting again that what validated and stuff like that. Exactly. You know what I ask you? I honestly don't know the answer. I have an idea because I've read. But in light of everything that we've discussed from the start, you know, the loving me, the taking care of me so I can take care of you, um, making better decisions, be in using, well, not just social media, but using the things around us for the right purposes, experiencing life in its full spectrum, ups and downs, in-betweens as they are. Relationships are quite important. And the Boardroom Podcast is about entrepreneurship. However, there is no successful entrepreneur with toxic relationships. It just doesn't work like that. You need to manage relationships. We, we have been tricked, you know. We have been tricked into thinking that love and relationships is about self-sacrifice. So I like to watch anime, all right? And in anime, especially shonen, the thing that is most admirable with the main character, and if you do otherwise, it's normally the villain that's doing otherwise, which is why I tend to like the villain. You should suffer. And when you suffer, you should suffer for someone else. And when they push you away and they treat you poorly, you should run after them and you should do your best for them because that's how much you love them and you're proving to them that you love them. And in Disney... It's the princess that gets saved from the burning castle with the dragon. The, the knight should dress up in shining armor and he should slay the dragon and he should rescue the princess and he should get down on his knees. And even though he's just fought a dragon for crying out loud, he should be clean and white and present white roses and propose and give her the day of her, her life in the wedding and live happily ever after. And that is not what love is. That is not how relationships work. Mm. How can we have it's a two-part question, but it's really one in the same, you know. How can we have meaningful, healthy relationships first with ourselves? So, you know, that's going to involve a lot of self-love, a lot of self-reflection, a lot of self-improvement. And then by extension, by having better relationships with ourselves, how do we have better relationships with each other? Now, you can be on the surface if you'd like. You can go deep. You can give pointers any answer at all, trust me, it's going to be valuable here. Please. Mm. So what you shared with kind of like that, you have to go through the pain or through difficult times. I think it's, if we look at the history of, um, of humankind, it's, I think it was very, very important back in the day. And also nowadays in specific, um, yeah, countries and specific cultures and so Asian cultures. Um, but especially back in the day where we did not have any kind of possibility or opportunity to also leave. Because nowadays, most people, I'd say, if we, like, we can go online, there's uh, an opportunity for us to get out of wherever we are from in that sense, even if it might take a while or it's it's um, dangerous. But most of the time, it's possible. Of course, there's always exceptions. So I'm not saying if someone is not able to do that, then of course, I'm not talking about those situations where it's just not physically possible. But if you look at the times hundreds of years ago, it was the where you were born into, that's where you also died, if we look at it in a, in a very direct way. So if you grew up as a, uh, or if you were born into a family that was all about farming, that's where you grew up, that's what you did, and that's where you ended. And it was hard work. I mean, I wasn't there, so I, I but what I know about history, it was sometimes awful, most of the time awful. The sickness, the the strenuous work people had to do. And the yeah. only way I believe that people had hope and didn't give up on life was that they're like, the more I struggle, the more beautiful the next life will be. Oh. Because if they were like, well, I have to utilize this gift. I have to, I can make this life beautiful. Most of the time it was just not possible. 
So the it would immediately take away all their hope. Nowadays, I believe we don't need that anymore. Even like I'm very open when it comes to spirituality or religion. So I I don't just take one uh, path and say this is the the right one. But we don't need that suffering anymore in order to later on live a better life. I do believe that we are here and we will everyone's pain because in life it's both or neither. You have positive and you have negative. If you take out the negative, then you will also take out the positive. It's just not possible to take, to choose just one side. Exactly. So it's really important to embrace that contrast of life. And it is necessary to suffer for a short period of time because that way you can learn and grow. But you don't have to suffer suffer all your life in order for you to to then experience something different. And I I see it as a as a gift of life, or the life itself is a gift. It might come from ego, but if I give you a gift, I would like you to appreciate it. And if you, on the other hand, give me a gift, and I just throw it away and be like, well, the the less or the 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 worse I treat it. The more I kind of like damage it, the more beautiful the next gift will be. Where it's like, really? Yeah. No. And also in that moment, I don't appreciate it. If I don't really don't like it, or if I really don't have use for it, mm-hmm. I can still communicate that. Mm-hmm. But if I pretend I like it, then you will just keep maybe giving me gifts that I just, I'm like, Ugh, I don't want it. But if I don't respect it, if I'm like, oh, I really like it, but I'm just going to throw it out or step on it, then I assume you will never give me a gift again. You're like, well, if you don't appreciate this one, why would I give you the next one? And I see the same in life. If we don't appreciate this life, then in case we will have a different life after this one, why would we get one where everything is beautiful if we didn't appreciate the first one? The human experience and suffering. I love that he took us back into history and helped us to understand that the, the idea back then was that life is full, filled with so much suffering that you had to connect it to a better tomorrow. And perhaps that is where the relationship flaw comes in of staying in toxic and abusive relationships. Because oftentimes the reason why people stay is because one, they've seen some sign that they believe that a person is changing or they hope, they maintain hope that a person will change. And that's perhaps a more romantic story, hence why it's popular in mainstream media, than is the idea of marriage for commitment and respect and then love and stuff like that. Um, okay. You've been wonderful today, Martin. It's been wonderful. I want to have you on in the future in a panel discussion with three other distinguished guests that we've had on the topic of living a holistic life in a sense it's not that that's not a topic i just want to spoil it so i'll reach out to you via email afterwards and you know we can parley and figure out if we can go about that how did you enjoy your time on the boardroom podcast today first of all thank you again for for having me here it was really a wonderful time um very thought-provoking questions i loved it um and yeah it was really beautiful uh, conversation and it's i just love like i mentioned before i just love what kind of the technology allows us to do because I don't think we would have probably ever met, you know, by chance maybe um, through traveling. But other than that, now we can like from across the world, we can, we can communicate, we can uh, get to know each other, build connection. And that's beautiful. So I appreciate that um, from your side as well, that you open that room and that space for, for creating connection. That's truly an incredible gift that you're giving people thank you i appreciate it and it's also very wonderful that we can share your knowledge and expertise share your knowledge and expertise with our audience i'm just gonna leave that in um before you go we have a tradition on the podcast where we like to ask our guests given that you have had such a wonderful time who is one guest that you would like to see on the podcast in the future and for this guest what is one question that you would like for us to ask this guest and have them answer for you what kind of guest? Oh, good question. It could be someone you admire, you look up to, someone you would like to talk to. Mm-hmm. So mm. it's 
it, I love those questions because it's kind of like, you know, what's your favorite movie? I'm, I have a background in acting. So it's like when someone asks me, like, what's your favorite actor? What's your favorite movie? Like blank. No names come to mind. Um, that's happening right now. It's like blank. There's so many th things happening at the same time in my brain right now. Simon Sinek could go on. Jordan Peterson. Um, I would, I would, I would go with like a musician I and I don't, I don't have a specific name in that sense, but someone who kind of, because it connects to what we talked about today, connection, social media, someone who grew up with social media. Cause I was about 20 when I first um, came in touch with social media, Instagram and all that. And mm -hmm. it would be very interesting to see or hear someone who grew up from, from the start with that kind of social media presence and see what is their um, opinion about connection, about using social media to, to reach other people. And maybe even the person that you, that you referred to earlier with the, with the proposal. Um, you know, where it's like, how does it fit together? Connecting with other people while kind of seeming like disconnecting in the same moment. So sounds beautiful. Let's um let's get it done. You have been wonderful. I thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise. And um, I will reach out via email. So let's exchange emails. We can organize that panel discussion and go from there. Thank you for your time today, awesome. Martin. You've been wonderful. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.